the greatest story of all. How many of you would like to know the greatest story of all? I would. We're going to look tonight, um, not at John chapter 11, verses 1 to 16, as it says on the screen. Uh, we're going to start out in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 through 20. And uh, we're going to tell the, the story. The story that is the greatest story of them all. And so uh, this is a good story for the kids. So if they want to be in here, they're not going to bother me. So that's for those who went to the nursery. Uh, I'm just going to tell the story today. <laughs> Stand together with me in reverence for the word of the Lord. I want to invite you to read these couple of verses of scripture aloud together with me. In reverence for the word of the Lord. Let's read together. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. It was not paid with mere gold or silver, which loses their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days he has been revealed for your sake. I invite you to hold up your copy of the scriptures, whether you have a, a tree version or an E version. And let's repeat this prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus, give me eyes to see, give me ears to hear, and a heart that is willing to be transformed through the power of your Holy Spirit and the greatest story of all. In Jesus' name I pray. Here in the season when we are telling our story. I want you to know we've got a good story to tell. Tonight is uh, the eve of Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday is that reminder every year that Jesus is our exalted king. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! In the highest! He's our king, he's our Lord, and, and we worship and we praise him, and we can wave the palm branches, and we can be excited about Jesus, our king. Jesus then is betrayed. After eating the Last Supper with his disciples, we, we sometimes have services in which we share communion, and we'll remember those events of what is traditionally called Monday Thursday. And as Jesus is betrayed with Judas' kiss, he is arrested and tried throughout the night. And of course, early on what we call Good Friday, he is crucified at nine in the morning. Suspended between heaven and earth with nails piercing hands and feet. He bleeds, he suffers. While the onlookers mock him and jeer, while even the criminals who are crucified with him would mock him, Jesus is on the cross until he dies and is buried. But uh, as Tony Coppola always likes to say, that was Friday. But Sunday's come. And on Easter Sunday morning, Jesus rose. That's why we call it the Lord's Day. It's the day of his resurrection. It's the day of his victory over the grave. It's the day that now we have the possibility of him coming and into our lives, giving us life eternal. It's a good story. It's such a good story that many of us here tonight, including me, as I've heard this story told, I put my faith in Jesus. And he became my Savior and my Lord, and I was given eternal life. It's a good story. But does this story miss some things? Is this story complete? Or is it a lot like Swiss cheese? That it has some holes in it. Swiss cheese tastes delicious until you take the bite where there's a hole. And then it leaves you 
wanting more. I want us tonight to consider the greatest story. We read from 1 Peter this reality. God chose him, Jesus, to be your ransom long before the world began, but now in these last days he's been revealed for your sake. Jesus was made known. He shared the gospel. He, he preached, and he was the ransom. He was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. God foreknew, God chose that Jesus would come. We've got a good story. Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter. But that's not the story that was told from the foundation of the world, from the beginning. You look back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. It's the fourth day of creation. And God spoke and he said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. I mean, I mean, here's the mystery. On day one, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light, and it was good. But that light was not the light of the sun. It was not the light of stars. It was not the light of the moon. Uh, if you will, it was the light of God's Shekinah glory. God said, this light is good. Isaiah tells us that God declares the end from the beginning. When you look into Revelation, you discover something. Guess what? When, when time is no more, and we are forever with the Lord, we will not have the light of the sun, the moon and the stars, but God will be the light. God will be the one who gives that radiance and that glory. And so even on day three, as God created all the plant life, the trees, and, and all the different things that grew and that we know scientifically depend upon light for photosynthesis to take place, that all took place without the sun. It happened by God's glory. That light that is eternal, that will never fade. So that even in Revelation, the trees that are along the river will continue to produce fruit every month. Not by the light of the sun, but by the light of his glory. And so here on day four, God says, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky. But he says, let these lights be for signs and for seasons. Now, when you and I read that, we might immediately think of seasons like summer, spring, winter, and fall. That, okay, yeah, you know, that's, that's kind of fixed. It happens about the same time every year, so the seasons are coming. But that's not the seasons God is talking about. God is specifically referred to in what is in the Hebrew referred to as the mode and the oath, the signs and the seasons. And the mode is God's appointed times. God's fixed moments in time that he is telling a story. That even in the constellations of the sky, God would sit Abraham down and tell him the story. Tell him the greatest story, the story of the gospel. And so it is for signs and for seasons. It goes all the way to creation. And think about this. This was day four. On what day were you and I created? Six. Six. And so before there was even a man or a woman to commemorate, remember, and acknowledge that God had set a time. God set the story in place. His appointed times were fixed so that we would know the story and be able to share with each other the greatest story of them all that began before any of us were ever born or created. So what is the greatest story that God put in those signs and seasons that are Revealed through the sun, the moon, and the stars. It is the Lord's appointed times. And his appointed times, I'm missing a slide, can be found in Leviticus chapter 23. 
So if you have your Bibles, turn to Leviticus 23. Because I'm going to turn there quick so that I can read what, I, what is missing in the order up there. Leviticus 23, verses 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed times, the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. You are to proclaim these as the mikra, as, as that which is to be rehearsed and told again and again and again. These are my appointed times. They're my sacred feasts, my sacred assemblies. I like how the NIV translated Genesis 1. I didn't mention this when it was there. The NIV has translated the signs of seasons as God's sacred days. Because that's what they are. They're, they're days that God has set apart and he said, these are my days. These are my times. And, and so God, here in Leviticus 23, he gives all of his appointed times. All of the days that are a part of his story. Of what he wants us to know and to understand. And so what are his appointed times? Now before I go on to the, 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 the first. There are, there are seven annual and there's one weekly. The Sabbath. There is Passover. There's unleavened bread. There is um, the first feast of first fruits. There's the feast of weeks or what we call Pentecost. There is the feast of trumpets. The day of atonement. And the Feast of Tabernacles. And as you read through the scriptures. Every one of those appointed times. You will find places where the scripture says. That this is to be a statute forever. This is to be a lasting ordinance. This is to continue from generation to generation. As long as time endures. Keep these feasts. That's true about all of them except one. I wonder if anybody knows tonight which one doesn't have the specific statement that you're to keep it forever. At least I haven't found it. So if somebody can find it for this one, uh, I'll be excited. The only one that doesn't say keep it as a lasting ordinance for a statute forever for all generations. The only one that's excluded is the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets, the appointed time of trumpets, which takes place in the fall of the year, um, September, October. So anyway, God's feast. So one of those appointed times, one of his feasts is the Sabbath. It's the weekly appointed time. Again, it is one that the Lord says it's appointed that you would keep this from generation to generation, that you should not neglect keeping the Sabbath. We're here tonight on that day. It's the seventh day. Right from the story of creation. On the seventh day, God rested. He blessed that day. He made it holy. In that, he, he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He blessed as the one who would extend the hand. And he blessed Adam and Eve with his presence. With, with, with words that we can only begin to imagine what God would have spoken over them. And so one of those days is God saying, six days you work, six days are yours to do whatever you would like, but the seventh day is mine. Seventh day belongs to me. Honor that. God gives the Ten Commandments. They're told in Exodus chapter 20 and in Deuteronomy chapter 5. They're repeated. And the fourth of those commandments has to do with the Sabbath. In Exodus, the Lord tells his people to remember the Sabbath. And that they are to remember the Sabbath, remembering that God is their creator. That he is the one who set this sto story in motion. He created all that there is. And that on that seventh day, God rested from all of his work. So remember the Sabbath. In Deuteronomy... It said that we are to guard or to observe the Sabbath. But we guard and observe it not because God is our creator, but he says guard the Sabbath because I want you to remember that you were once slaves in Egypt. But I've delivered you. I've brought you out of Egypt, out of bondage. We were once slaves to sin. 
But God brought us out. That's the great story. He's delivered us. And he's given us a weekly reminder to come back to him and remember he has set me free. Now, he's given us Sunday through Friday to do whatever we want. So there's not a problem with coming and worshiping on Sunday. But will we recognize that the seventh day belongs to God? Or will we treat it like any other? You see, we are taught, and it's true, this is the spiritual reality. Jesus said, come unto me, any of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. I will give you rest. I will give you Sabbath. I will give you peace, wholeness in your life, because you can come to me, and I will teach you, for I am gentle and humble of heart. Behold, my burden is not heavy. It won't cause you to be weary. And so we can have this rest in Jesus 24-7. But does that spiritual reality mean we should ignore the seventh day? I just want to throw this out for you. I encourage you to read Hebrews chapter 4 and to study it on your own. In that, God there several times repeats the reality that he declared on an oath that because of Israel's disobedience, that because they broke covenant, because they didn't want to honor God, he said, they shall never enter my rest. They're not going to get into this rest that I have promised. And yet God says that if Joshua had provided rest for them, then God would not speak of another day that we could have rest. And so there is still a day coming when we can enter into rest. And so the writer of Hebrews tells us, therefore make every effort to enter into that rest, that day that's to come. I wonder if we might discover that when we set apart the Sabbath as a day that is holy, because I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Because God said, this is my day. God said, I've blessed this day. God said, I've made it different from all the others. You can have, my, you can have Sunday through Friday, but the Sabbath day's mine. I wonder if we acknowledge that that day belongs to God and we begin to treat it differently. If we're not making the effort to enter his rest, then we'll have greater rest. I, I just wonder. I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't, don't think I'm preaching legalism. I'm not. I'm encouraging us to, 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 to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. What does God expect of us? Because this is his story. And God included in his story, according to the signs and, and the seasons, the sun, moon, and stars... God included that there's a Sabbath, a seventh day. Do you ever wonder why we have a seven-day week? God set it up that way. From creation. And so, will we recognize the Sabbath as one of those days that God has set apart and said, this is my day. This is my appointed time. And that it's different from every other day. Or will we think that every day is the same? God then begins to describe the seven annual feasts. And it's the greatest story you could ever imagine. It begins with the Passover. The Passover, if you remember, is the story of the Exodus. We're going to celebrate it together on Thursday night. And I hope that you can be there. Because the Passover story begins with God's judgment upon Egypt. It's God's judgment upon sin. God brings ten plagues upon the, the, the nation of Egypt, and it is the final plague, the plague of death of the firstborn, that God finally works deliverance for his people. But, but God said every firstborn is going to die. You see, God had made a distinction in some of the plagues. He had made the distinction in the plague of darkness, for example, that when God covered the sun so that it was dark throughout the land of Egypt, God said... I'm smarter than they are. It's going to be dark over here. But in the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, they're going to have plenty of light to see. 
So God made a distinction for his people. But when it came to the last plague, the plague of death, Moses was told, every firstborn of man and of animal in all of Egypt, both Egypt and Israel, will die. Except for those who take the blood of a Passover lamb. That they will take that Passover lamb, that lamb from their herd on the tenth day of that month, that they would take it and they'd bring it into their homes. And then on the 14th day, they would sacrifice and kill it and take its blood and they would put it upon the doorposts of their home so that then death would pass over them, would skip them. And in that night, as, as they ate the first Passover Seder, as they ate the unleavened bread and as they ate the roasted lamb, a cry began to come out through Egypt at midnight that death was coming into each household. Everywhere where there was not blood, death came to the firstborn, even to the firstborn of Pharaoh. And when Pharaoh realized that his son was dead, and as he cried out for his gods to restore that life, and nothing happened, he finally called to Moses and Aaron and said, get out of here, leave, take your animals, take your people, and go worship your God. I don't want to see you anymore. Moses prayed for me. This is the story of the Passover. It is a, the Passover is the story of death. What we fail to realize is that Jesus perfectly fulfilled the Passover. Remember, the Passover began, it's a season of time that began at the beginning of the month. And the critical event that first took place was on the 10th day of the month when there would be the Passover lamb that would be chosen. And for centuries, the Jewish people had been practicing or rehearsing this so that the high priest would leave the temple and he would make a journey to Bethlehem, which is where the sheep would be. And he would choose the lamb for the nation that would be the Passover lamb. And as he would come riding on a colt back into the city of Jerusalem, he would have that lamb with him. And as he entered into the city of Jerusalem, the people would begin to shout and exclaim, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! But suddenly Jesus comes on the scene. And Jesus, six days before Passover, was anointed at Bethany. And Jesus was anointed by Mary on a Friday night. As they reclined around the table, she anointed his feet and Jesus said, her story will be told everywhere because this is the greatest thing that ever could have happened. Everybody's going to have this included in the greatest story ever told because she's prepared me for burial. She's brought the incense. And John says that then the next morning Jesus made this entry into Jerusalem and as he came into Jerusalem riding on a borrowed colt, his disciples and the others began to exclaim, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I believe that in the same way that Peter was given the revelation that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, that it was given by the Father, I believe the Father spoke to his disciples and said, you see what's happening right now. My chosen lamb is coming into Jerusalem. My chosen lamb has been selected. And so Jesus comes in and they break out in the statement that had been made for centuries. And now do you want to know why the others got so upset? Why all of the religious leaders scolded Jesus? Tell them to be quiet. It wasn't just that they thought that the Romans were going to be upset. That it was a national declaration of independence and that Jesus would be king. That, that's a good part of the story. But they understood that. The high priest was still on his way from Bethlehem. And then with the first cry of Hosanna, all the people began to do what they had done for years and years and years, all their lives, just like we celebrate Thanksgiving. They came out with palm branches and with cloaks and laid them before the high priest. Only this wasn't the high priest man had chosen. This was the high priest Jesus riding on the colt as the Lamb of God. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus fulfilled this on a Sabbath. 
And isn't it appropriate that the Lamb of God, God's Son, would be exalted and declared the Lamb of God on the Sabbath because he said over and over and over again, the Son of Man, Messiah, is what? Lord of the Sabbath. Now the next thing that takes place is Jesus cleanses the temple. But that doesn't happen until the next day. And you see, that's how we can know that this was a Sabbath and not a Sunday. And so tonight, I, I, my, my palm branch that was up here is lost. This really is Palm Saturday. If this is the Holy Week, this is Palm Saturday. How do we know it took place on a Sabbath, on a Saturday? Jesus had no problem getting in the face of the Pharisees and the religious leaders and saying, you have said this, but I'm telling you it's okay to take, if it's okay for you to pull your mule out of a pit when it's fallen in on the Sabbath, then it's okay for me to heal a man with a withered hand. If it's okay for, for you to do that, it's okay for me to say to the blind man, you can see. It's okay for me to say to, he, he upset the Pharisees and religious leaders at every turn. He would not have had a problem going into the temple on the Sabbath and turning over tables. Because he had done it before. The problem was the shops were all closed. Because the Jews were good at keeping the Sabbath. This is a day for worship. So if you're going to come and bring an offering, exchange your money the day before. Because we're not going to open the temple shops and money exchange on, sun, on the Sabbath. That will only be done Monday or Sunday through Friday. And so Jesus, the next day, on Sunday, fashions a whip and he cleanses the temple. Something significant, though, takes place throughout those days. That is the inspection of the lamb. When the high priest would bring in that lamb that he chose from Bethlehem, he would bring it to the temple and tie it up. And then all of the other pr priests and the Levites, they'd come and they'd look at the lamb. They'd run their fingers through its wool. And they would be checking to see, is this lamb spotless? Is it perfect? Until finally, on the day before Passover... The high priest, having heard everyone's opinions, he would come and stand over that lamb and he would say, I find no fault in him. What do the Pharisees, Sadducees, and religious leaders do for Jesus every day when he is in the temple? They begin questioning him and examining him. They are inspecting the lamb. And when Jesus is put on trial, it is not the high priest. But it is God who uses Pilate, a Gentile, uh, who doesn't even fear God, who declares the very words that are to be spoken over the Lamb. I find no fault in him. Amen. And Jesus perfectly fulfills the greatest story of them all. There's no fault in him. But yet they take him out and they crucify him on the Passover. On that day, because we think of Passover as being a great big meal like Thanksgiving. But that's really the Feast of Unleavened Bread that begins the, as the night of Passover, as that sun is setting, the new day is beginning, the 15th day, the first day of Unleavened Bread that we'll look at in just a second. Passover is not a feast, it is a sacrifice. Because that's the day all the lambs were killed. They would bring the lambs, every family, into the temple, and Levites and priests and others would be sacrificing lambs all throughout the day. And the high priest would be there sacrificing lambs. And as he would sacrifice the lambs, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the high priest has been at it all day. Can you picture it? Can you see it in your mind? He's covered in blood. He's killed a few animals today, along with all the other guys. But now, he only has one lamb left to kill. And he says, I thirst. And they give him a drink. And he takes that lamb that he had brought back from Bethlehem, that everyone had inspected, that he had declared, I find no fault in him. And he takes the knife, and he cuts it in his throat. And he says, it is finished. Jesus, as our high priest from the cross, as he was on the cross from 9 a.m., at noon the sun grew dark. Everybody knew something unusual was taking place that day. And he cries out in anguish until at 3 o'clock in the afternoon he says, I thirst. And they give him a sponge with some wine. And he raises one last voice. And with a final breath he says, It is finished. And he breathes.
Greece is last. And Jesus perfectly fulfills Passover as God's Passover lamb. Joseph of Arimathea receives permission from Pilate to take the body down from the cross. The legs of the others are broken by requests of the religious authorities because they did not want them to remain there on the high holy day of the first day of unleavened bread. Remember the Jewish calendar, the day begins at sunset. The sun is about to set. Joseph of Arimathea along with Nicodemus quickly take the body of Jesus down and before the sun sets they bury him in Joseph's tomb. Jesus said, this is the sign that you will know that I am God's anointed chosen one. As Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and for three nights, so too will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. What happens to the high priest? Remember, he's all covered in blood. He has said, it's finished. The high priest, with his priestly garments on, he, as he has finished that, in preparation for unleavened bread and first fruits, the high priest, he goes and excludes himself from all the others, and he hides himself inside Mount Moriah. He baptizes himself in a mikvah to be cleansed of the blood and the impurity, and he waits there until the morning of first fruits. It just so happens that in this particular year, it's three days and three nights. Because Jesus was buried at sunset on Wednesday, so he is in the tomb on Wednesday night, and Thursday, one night, one day. He's in the tomb on Thursday night and Friday, one day, two days and two nights. He's in the tomb on uh, Friday night and Saturday day, three days and three nights. Before the sun sets on that third day, Saturday, the Sabbath, the Lord of the Sabbath is raised. You see, because Jesus, in the same way that the high priest is taken and hidden in Mount Moriah, he is taking the impurity and taking the, the, the blood, and it's being separated. Jesus is buried, and he separates our sin from us and takes it to the grave. Aren't you glad that you don't have to bear your sin no more? He bore it, and he took it to the depths of hell. But that's not the end of the greatest story. Because when the sun was setting on that third day, the Sabbath, Jesus rose. Matthew gives away the hint. As he tells the story of the crucifixion in Matthew chapter 27, verses 52 and 53, Matthew says that there was a great earthquake. And that when the earth shook, some of the tombs were open. Why, why, does he why does he say that? It's because on that day, the priests were making their way out into the barley fields, and they were marking ten omers of barley so that on the next morning they could go and they could harvest them so that they would be given as the first fruits offering, God's appointed time. I've gotten behind in clicking. I just put those up there so you know what they are. I'm not reading those. Um, but they're God's appointed times. In the same way that the priest would mark the barley, God gave an earthquake and he marked some graves. And they were open. And in verse 53 Matthew of Matthew 27, he tells us that after Jesus' resurrection, some of the righteous dead showed themselves alive in Jerusalem. What happens with the high priest? On the day, on the morning of first fruits, it is the day after the regular Sabbath, which is always a Sunday. First fruits is always on a Sunday. What happens with the high priest? He comes out of his hiding from down in Mount Moriah, and so he is down below the temple, and he is going to ascend up to the temple where he is going to take those. Uh, first fruits offerings that have been harvested by the Levites, and he will present them as a wave offering to the Lord. As he comes out, everybody is excited. Look, he's clean. He's in his priestly robes. He's glorified. He's wonderful. And they all want to touch him. They, they all want to grab hold of him because he is their high priest. It's like, it's like this is the 4th of July. Let's celebrate. Here comes our high priest. But every year, he would say the same thing. For centuries, they had rehearsed this, and the high priest would say, don't take hold of me. For I have not yet ascended unto my God and your God, to your Father and to our Father. And he would ascend and present the offering when Jesus, on the first day of the week, when Mary Magdalene is at the tomb, early in the morning, she comes, not expecting a resurrection. 
Here is one of the most faithful followers of Jesus. This is the woman who anointed him for his burial. This is the one who loved him with all of her heart. She is there at the tomb weeping over what she believes is a stolen body of her Savior. Lord, where are you? And that's when Jesus shows up. She thinks he's the gardener. James, if you've taken his body, would you please tell me so that I can go to him? I mean, James is a good worker. He takes care of things around here. It would be James. She would think he was James if it were here. Tell me where he is. And what does Jesus say? He says the very same words that the high priest says. Don't take hold of me, Mary. For I have not yet ascended to my God and to your God to my father and to your father. But you go tell my disciples that I'll see them soon. Because what does Jesus do? He ascends to heaven and those righteous dead ascend with him and he presents them as a wave offering before the father that they are the first fruits of the resurrection. And so you see, our story about Easter is a good story. We celebrate a risen Savior, but we miss the fact that at first fruits, it's not just the Savior who was raised. It was the righteous dead who were raised, presented to the Father, that they now guarantee the future harvest of the righteous who will live forever to forever be with the Lord. Do you understand the greatness of this story? That's an assurance for you and me that there has been an offering. There has been a wave presented to the Lord God in heaven that says, one day, these folks who've gathered on a Saturday night, these folks who, who have believed in my name, these folks who've confessed me as their Lord and who believe that I was dead and buried but have been raised from the dead, these folks, death won't hurt them. Amen. But they too shall rise. It, it was the Easter after my dad died that God planted that in my heart and it was like... I can't celebrate Easter anymore. It's first fruits. This is the day that Jesus guaranteed that not only all of those who were dead in the graves when he when they showed themselves alive that they were presented, but there is an absolute guarantee that my dad will rise again and he will live forever because he had that hope in Jesus. And if he will live, I will live. I don't want to just celebrate Easter. It's too small. It celebrates a risen Savior. I want to celebrate first fruits because first fruits acknowledges a risen Savior who will raise us. It's a great story. But the story doesn't end there. And I'm just going to give you the crib notes now. It goes on that after first fruits, you count seven weeks to the 50th day. This too is always a Sunday. After first fruits is the Feast of Weeks, the day that we call Pentecost. Jesus will not only just fill you with the Spirit. That's what we as a Pentecostal church, we have, you know, I lived for Pentecost. You know, I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I can pray in an unknown language and I can worship the Lord with my spirit and in truth. I, I, I got something that, that other folks may not have. I've accepted the full, but, it, but Pentecost is not just about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus establishes a new covenant he writes his law upon our hearts and he fills us with his spirit so that we can obey his law. Amen. That's what Pentecost is all about. But the story doesn't end with Pentecost. It continues into the fall. That in the fall, as they bring in the fall harvest, there is the day and the hour that no man knows. It's trumpets. Jesus is coming again. Amen. With the last trump, with the call of God, the dead in Christ shall raise, and we who remain shall be caught up to be with the Lord forever. I'm listening for that trumpet. Amen. That is the next appointed time on God's calendar that Jesus will keep. He will fulfill it perfectly, just as he perfectly fulfilled every other feast in the first part of the story. He will perfectly fulfill this one. He will come at a day and an hour. We don't know, but it will be on trumpets. <coughs> We'll, 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 we'll know the signs of his coming. That's what Paul told the, Thessal the Thessalonian church. You know about that day. Because I've taught you to, to look at the feasts, at the appointed times. These are, the, these are God's schedule. These are the signs and the season that he established as part of his story from creation. Next is the Day of Atonement. On the tenth day of that month, trumpets, by the way, is the only one that begins at the first new sighting of the new moon. It's the first day of the month. Interesting little fact. Tenth day of the month is the Day of Atonement. This is the day that Jesus will judge. 
living in the dead. He will once and for all atone for sin, cover it. And whoever's name is not found in the Lamb's book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. There will be a separation. He will be like the shepherd who takes the sheep and puts them to his right side and the goats that he puts to his left side. And he'll say to the ones on his right side, Enter in, because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was in prison, you visited me. When you've done it to the least of these, he tells them, because they ask, well, when did we ever see these things? When you've done it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it unto me. So enter in. But then he will look to the goats that he put to the left. Interestingly enough, throughout the Old Testament, both the sheep and the goats are considered clean. Clean animals. So there will be some religious people who will be separated to the left. They said, we're clean. We're pure. But Jesus will tell them, depart from me, because when I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. When I was alone in prison, you didn't come and visit me. You did not care for me at all. Lord! <laughs> You've you got to be mistaken. you got to be thinking of somebody else, not me. We, we cast out demons in your name. We, we prophesied in your name. Lord! When would we have ever done these things? When you've not done it to the least of these, you've not done it unto me. And Jesus will have made the distinction, and his judgment will be final. Once and for all. But the grand finale is tabernacles. And for seven days, Israel rehearsed and practiced the reality that they remembered that God brought them out of Egypt and they dwelled in shelters and booths. And we expect the day when as Jesus returns, we will dwell with the Lord forever. We will tabernacle with him. The word became flesh and dwelt, tabernacled among us. We beheld his glory. We will one day behold his glory, no longer through the mirror or the glass darkly that Paul describes, but we will see him face to face. And so shall we forever be with the Lord. Did I tell you this is a great story? Yeah. It doesn't leave anything out because it's God's story. From beginning to end, he fashioned it, he made it, and he tells this story. So as we conclude tonight, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you? I want to ask you, first of all, the most important question. Have you responded to God's greatest story of them all? Have you accepted Jesus as your Lord? Jehovah, God of the very God, the Eternal One, the One who, being God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped and held on to, but He made Himself nothing and He became human just like you and me. And He revealed the Father to us and He died. But He didn't just die, He was raised again. Have you believed that He is your Lord? God has raised him from the dead? If you, if you have, you've been saved. You've been born again. You've, you've been born from above and, and, and your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But, but if you haven't believed that, the greatest story of all is just waiting for you to embrace it. To be a part of those who will tabernacle with the Lord forever. Tonight can be your night to make that decision. Secondly, for many of us, we're Christians. We've grown up in the church. We've believed in Jesus all of our lives and most of our lives. So what will we do with God's greatest story? Will we embrace God's story that we would want to learn it and share it with others so that they too might be saved? Or will we despise God's story wanting to hold on to our short story instead? Father, it's your story. We, Lord, desire tonight that you would write your story upon our hearts. That by your Holy Spirit, you would lead and guide us in truth. And reveal to us these mysteries that as Isaiah said, you would declare the end out of the beginning. That those things that you declared, you would bring about. And Lord, you've done that. You did it in your son, Jesus. 
as you have perfectly fulfilled the spring appointed times of Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost, you will in the same way perfectly fulfill the fall feasts of trumpets, day of atonement, and tabernacles. That's our hope, that's our expectancy that you will come again for us. Lord, may we learn your story. May we share your story so that others too might be saved. Lord, for that one tonight that might be here that has never responded to your story, that's never really fully understood the greatness and the wonder of God's story of salvation, that Lord, tonight you would enable them to take that step of faith and acknowledge Jesus as their Lord that he is the Lamb of God who died and was raised again so that they too might be saved. Lord, write their name in your book of life so that they will have a confidence and a hope that is eternal. We give you thanks, Lord, for making us a part of your story, that we can be those whose names have been written down because we heard your story we believed it to be true. May we now be empowered by your spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, to share your story. Make us storytellers in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. I love you. Have a great evening of fellowship out in the lobby. Okay, we got some desserts. If you've taken that step of faith to accept Jesus, I pray that you will share that with somebody. The scriptures tell us that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. It's important that you tell somebody the decision that you've made. If you want to spend some time here in prayer, you're welcome to do that. Let's keep our conversation and fellowship out in the lobby that anybody who wants to pray tonight has that freedom to just seek the Lord. Have a great night in Jesus' name.